Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the countdown. Uh, if you have uh, not met either of us, uh, my name is Amanda. I'm the director of communication, uh, and this is Andrew Hudson, and he is the missions and serving coordinator. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, I got it right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Pastor Julian graduated yesterday, uh, so we thought we'd give him a little day off. Congrats, Julian. Countdown. I know. I hope you're watching, <laughs> Julian. You get extra credit if you're watching. We'll see if he... Well, he's already graduated. Does that actually kind of really matter <laughs> at this point? Where does that go? What does that apply to? <laughs> I'll add that to your diploma. Uh, but we're so proud of him. We're so excited Very for him. Um, and I'm yeah. so excited to have Andrew here. Uh, we're going to talk yeah. a little bit about mission and serving in just a little bit. But if you are joining us for the countdown for the first time, this is our way to connect with you uh, as a pre-worship little checklist of things to do before you enter into worship with us today. Uh, so uh, there's different ways to connect with us. If you're watching on Facebook or if you're watching on the website, you can comment in the feed. Uh, we know how many screens are joining us, but we don't know who you are unless you comment. Uh, there is a phone know. number. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is a phone number at the bottom of your screen, 817-477-6498. You can text us at that number. If you're watching on Roku uh, or a smart TV, that's a great way to connect with us through there. Uh, and then you can also always email us at info at fmcm.org and probably the most yes. important way to connect with us is on our online bulletin so you can go to our online bulletin fmcm.org slash bulletin uh, and there you can uh, fill out our connection card to let us know that you are worshiping with us today uh, you can make a gift if you want to and then you can sign up for all the things you can see all the different all announcements the so many things uh, so many there's a start. rumor that churches just kind of shut down for the summer <laughs> uh, and if anybody knows that they don't it's Andrew and myself <laughs> no uh, they they do not, not. We do not. We are not shutting down this summer. In fact, we're probably revving up a little bit more. So. Oh, yeah. We have so many things to do this summer. So many things. Uh, so let's just dive in and talk about all the things. So today, uh, we have lots going on. Uh, today in the service, uh, or this weekend in the services, we are giving our second graders Bibles. So, Yay! Uh, I'm so excited my son gets a Bible for the first time. So Is he excited about it? Uh, uh, no. But How does he, he feel about having to go up to the front? He, I don't think it's all computed with him yet that he has to go. He's like, you're not going to go with me? Mm -mm, you're on your own. Get on up there. Uh, but I remember seeing second graders get their Bibles forever, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, yeah. it's his turn. So uh, I love that our church does that. And it's not um, – they're really good children's Bibles, Yeah. Uh, which I'm really excited about. There he is right there. There's my son. Um, so I'm really How excited about that. How is he tall enough to look through that window? He, he has good genes. Uh, my husband <laughs> lifts him up. We have the tiniest window in this door. <laughs> we have the tiniest window in this door that's just we can see it from the outside world. And um, I think the last one was David. It was, was for Pastor sure David. David. Yeah. That was David. That was for sure David. Uh, so we are celebrating our second graders. And then tonight yeah. we are celebrating our seniors. So yeah. our high school seniors are having senior celebration. And they get a um, Bible too. And they get a Bible too. We just hand Look out Bibles that. to everybody. <laughs> I Two love it. One. Uh, and it's a different season. So they get a different Bible, which we're, um, which we're excited about. So, Absolutely. Uh, we have that going on. Yesterday was the gathering. So we had a multi-generational. Um, mm -hmm. activity event. I was not able to make it, but Andrew, I was there and I had so much fun, and I got a good tan. Oh yeah, it was. It when did it, we skipped spring? We did completely yeah. skipped spring, skipped spring and went straight to summer. It is 100 degrees, but here. that did not stop us from having fun. Julian commented. Extra credit. Good. Way to go, Julian. Way to Proud go. of you. Thanks for watching Proud us. Of you. I just got so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Way too excited for that. Uh, so we're. Uh, it was. It was hot, but I heard it was a great event. It was. I. They put me in charge of wiffle ball. Okay. And so we had some kids out there hitting dingers, just absolute home runs. I would. I would be day. a little nervous about. That I would not be asked to be in charge of wiffle ball. They. They asked me to be in charge, <laughs> and uh, they did really well. And I. The way I, I was. All time pitcher. All time pitcher. And the, and the way I threw the ball to the little ones was a little different than some of our middle school and high school students that tried to hit it. Do you have to like run oh, after I it? I struck I struck them out. <laughs> The middle school and no high school mercy. students, no mercy. No mercy Struck at the wiffle right ball. Out. That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah, so we had wiffle ball. We had burgers. Uh, it was just a great event for multi-generations. Um, yesterday was busy. It was a so, busy day. Uh, we are so Lots thankful for on. those that uh, made plans to join us and to be there. We just, everybody's going to come over here and wave. Art <laughs> Brooks. Uh, so it is, uh, it is exciting. Uh, it's an exciting weekend uh, yeah. for sure. Well, and a part of the gathering was a dessert competition. And I know he's already gotten one shout out today, but your son actually won third place that is so in the exciting. dessert competition. We're not going to tell him that there were three desserts. What that doesn't need <laughs> no. We don't need to bring that part up. But he he doesn't know that. He doesn't. Well, we want to. Well, and what kind of uh, cupcakes were they? So uh, he made rainbow cupcakes, which now how much help 
did you give him? I didn't give him any because I wasn't with him, but my mother oh, helped him. Um, but he is the one that found the recipe. Like this is his this is his jam. This is his secret recipe. The they looked cupcakes. good. They have a lot of food coloring. <laughs> I, was telling you, I was like, oh, we're gonna keep going, and you know yeah. me, like the blue food coloring. It was mostly red. Red seemed to be the more overpowering color that he chose. It, it was it was a rainbow and a cupcake, so <laughs> I'm sure it tasted just like that too. And the way your mouth looked after eating it, I'm sure was <laughs> I cannot. Just great. I cannot. Uh, so Andrew uh, is really here representing our missions and serving team. Um, and yeah. so uh, today also, uh, everybody's bringing their paper bags back yep. filled with food for Feed the Kids. So Andrew, tell us a little bit about what Feed the Kids is. So Feed the Kids is a program that was started by an organization in our city called Common Grounds, uh, which is a collaboration of a bunch of different churches, nonprofits, and local businesses that partners with Mansfield ISD to serve all the students in Mansfield ISD, in particular those who uh, don't have the access to a lot of different th resources that some of us may have. Uh, and so one of, Feed the Kids <laughs> is one of their biggest programs. I love it. And it's all about making sure that every kid within Mansfield ISD has something to eat every day throughout the summer. Because uh, a lot of these students uh, who are on free reduced lunch at school, like, what they get at school may be the only meal that they yeah. have that day. And so summertime is a very stressful time for a lot of those families. And so uh, a lot of the, uh, these churches came together and decided, you know what, we want to do something for I these kids. Uh, and so every single week throughout the summer, starting the last week of May, uh, we hand out 790 boxes wow. of food. And each box has seven breakfasts and seven lunches in them. I love that. Uh, and so any kid... 790 bo uh, boxes a week? A week. That is crazy. Per week. <laughs> That's a lot. Uh, it's a lot of food, and uh, they. we just want to make sure that everybody's fed, and any student or any child within Mansfield SD can come get a box. There's no questions asked. There's no paperwork to fill out. No, you come up and say, I need food. You a box. You're handed a box. So we uh, we are one of those churches that have partnered up. Um, and I love, uh, this is one of my favorite days um, of our of our existence, of our year, uh, because everybody just brings everything in. So the things to focus on, first of all, it is not too late. We are collecting no. food throughout the whole summer. Yes. Um, so think about a um, 10, 11, 12, 13-year-old at home, parents are working, mm -hmm. what can they cook? Uh, and that's that's what you should get. So yeah. pre-made um, things that can go in the microwave. So uh, which they didn't have these when I was a kid, but the little microwavable macaroni and cheese. Yep. I haven't decided if I like those yet, but With the, those, I, those are the most popular. I things. lived off those in college. See, uh, and, ramen? I lo and I love them. Ramen noodles. Ramen noodles. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> ramen noodles. Uh, anything Chef Boyardee that can has a little pop top that can go in the microwave. Mm -hmm. uh, tuna, chicken, anything like that that they can go ahead and just put in the microwave and yeah. cook. Uh, that's what you need to focus on. So go to Sam's, go to Costco. Everybody goes to the grocery store on Sunday. Yep. And I know this because I go to the grocery store on Sunday. And that's when we go. And everybody is there. Yeah, everybody. Uh, but Always see somebody you know, which is fun. You do. Uh, so I'm going to challenge myself. I do a lot of grocery pickup. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to challenge myself to put something in my cart every single time that I can bring here. And uh, what I love about our campus, too, is we have big blue bins. Yes. So somebody's Eagle Scout project was to create big blue bins for our campus. And we have six of them. Is that six correct? Yep, six of them throughout the campus. And so they are throughout the campus, not just indoors, but we have them at every building outdoors as well. So uh, if you are like, I'm going to go pick up my groceries and I'm just going to swing by, you can bring them to the church. Yeah. Uh, every building off. has, just look for a big blue bin. Yeah. Uh, and you can put those in there. So yeah, I, and I check those blue, those bins every day. I love uh, it to make sure that we pick them up. We get them over to the Feed the Kids warehouse over on the west side of town, and we get those distributed to all the distribution sites. Which we are, our church is a distribution site along with six other organizations throughout our city. So we spread out throughout the entire city to make sure we cover every part of Mansfield ISD. Our church does so much for the community, um, and a lot of that stuff, and you probably, your eyes have been opened a lot since you've it taken has. on this position. Yeah. Um, there's just so much stuff that I found out, like, we do that? Yeah. Uh, it is so much that we can't even put it out there uh, fast enough for people yeah. to know. So uh, not only are we collecting food for Feed the Kids, but if you want to look for something, to, to a way to serve throughout mm -hmm. the summer as well, there are serving opportunities um, alongside Feed the Kids. So getting those boxes ready, distributing yeah. those boxes. So if you have any questions about that, uh, you can comment in this thread, you can text us, or you can email us at info at fmcm.org. And all you have to really say is, I want to know more. I want to know more on how to serve. You want to serve? We'll find your spot. Uh, Andrew's also been really, really active in uh, Hands of Christ. So yeah. do you want to talk a little bit about what that is, too? Yeah. So Hands of Christ <laughs> is a 
just it's, it's people within our congregation who love to serve. Uh, and a lot of that shows itself in more hands-on type projects, uh, maybe some some landscaping that needs to be done at somebody's house who can't do it anymore, uh, maybe an elderly person in our congregation or a disabled person in our congregation or somebody who's been sick and just can't take care of the everyday things that we take care of around our home. And so we get uh, volunteers together and we get the needed materials and we go out and we serve these people. Uh, and so typically we have... Th- six big projects that we do throughout the year. So there's one in starting in March. We go March, April, May. Uh, we do like usually the like third Saturday hmm. of those months. We do some big projects and then we start and then we take summer off because it's really, really hot. So hot. And <laughs> then we start back up in September. We do September, October, November. We do one big project for each of those ones. But uh, what a lot of people don't see, and that it doesn't get advertised a whole lot, but there are smaller needs that happen mm. throughout the week or throughout the months uh, where people just say, hey, I need help. I need that my toilet is broken. It needs to be replaced or it needs the insides of it need to be swapped out. Uh, and so when stuff like that come in, we get a lot of our volunteers who are retired. Uh, and so we get them during the week. I love and that. And we send a couple of us out there, and we take care of these smaller things. Uh, this past week, we did a little fence replacement. Uh, Look at a you. gate A <laughs> gate had fallen apart, and this uh, lady couldn't open it to get access to her backyard, and it was just a hassle. Oh, wow. And so we were like, you know what? We have some pretty handy people here in this we church. Do this. And so we got together, and we rebuilt her fence and her gate. And and there's actually that's actually one thing I know a little bit about is fences. He, he used to do fencing. I used to do fencing in a past life. <laughs> in a past, you're not even old enough to have a past. Life. <laughs> My past life, I used to do fencing. Yeah, yeah. I, I love Years that. So ago. it's a great way to serve. So some people are like, I, I don't want to be in a classroom with um, children or students. Like that's not my jam. I'm I not really that. musical. Uh, but if you're good with your hands, if you like to help others, if you're mm-hmm. pretty crafty or uh, crafty is probably not the right word, but maybe crafty, handy, handy, handy. Uh, yeah. We have we have things for you to do. Absolutely. Uh, so all you need to really do again, you can email us at info at fmcm.org. You can text us. Um, mm-hmm. You can email serving at fmcm.org. Yep. There's a lot of ways uh, that you can connect with us. But in there, just let us know and just say, hey, I'm pretty handy. So if you ever need me, uh, I think they just, they can, y'all continue to have a list. I'm like, who can oh, we yeah. call? What does this look like? So the more people we have to serve, oh, uh, there's the always needs out there. So uh, I love that we are able to to really funnel mm-hmm. people into those opportunities and, and oh, yeah. projects. So yeah, and those and those needs that come in, they they don't stop. And there's always a, there's always somebody in need. But and that's what we do as a church. We yeah. are here to serve, and we want to answer those calls whenever they come in. So. It's so great that we and we get those phone calls like, hey, you know, we need help, and um, we're not really, we, you know, we don't turn anybody down. We, no, we're we do not to... turn anybody away. And that was a big reason why um, one other thing that we've actually just started this this month was our own food pantry yes here at the church yeah yeah so we have a food so just bring food <laughs> bring food <laughs> bring food we, we can sort we it out it. you don't have to label it like this is feed the kids but yep. we do we have a small food pantry here on campus mm-hmm. uh, so we don't need to turn anybody away we can definitely say you know what you need food we have food and yeah. so uh, i love it our, our mission and serving building has gotten quite a makeover it's still in the process it looks beautiful down but there it's incredible it's incredible and i know as uh, more groups are going to start meeting down there and um i just well, love how the lord has been working it's really. going to be well used down there <laughs> it will for sure be well used. And I, today, or this week too, I was able to deliver a heart meal. So yeah. if you like to cook and you have like a good soup recipe, uh, I'm just putting this out there. I don't even know if I, we can do that. Uh, let us know. <laughs> Cause, uh, oh, throw it out there. We'll we, it. Uh, we deliver uh, just little heart meals. So it's not like for a full family no. or for a week. It is just, it's a container of soup. It's a thing of... Um, it's a thing of crackers. It's a little note that just to say, hey, your church is thinking about yeah. you. And um, I was able to deliver one this week just out of the blue to somebody, and it really it really blessed them. So yeah. I'm really I'm really happy about that. Yeah. that. That's been a really cool thing that we started over the past few months, and it's a partnership with Care Ministry. They kind of yes. identify the people who are in need and just maybe are going through a hard time, have been sick, and just are kind of feeling down on the dumps. We, we want them to know that their church is praying for them, that yes. we love them, that we're thinking about them. And here's a, a yummy... So soup. another way to serve, you can cook soup, um, or you can deliver the soup, or you can deliver the soup. So and it really it takes no there time. You go. Uh, it takes no time. So uh, lots of different ways to serve. Uh, another way to serve is to help out with VBC. We have Vacation Bible Camp coming up. So one, register for that if yeah. you haven't already. Uh, and then also Mission Week, which we know is a huge opportunity to serve. Yes. Lots of different things to do there. So uh, just pray about that. Pray about how God can use you and how you can serve this morning. Not just this morning. You can serve. Pray about it this morning on how you can serve. 
That's yeah. probably the best way to say there that. There we go. Um, and worship is about to start. We're continuing our season of Real Christianity, which I'm getting excited about. We only have, I think, one or two more weeks, and then we're diving wow. into, we're going to take on the book of Ephesians for this summer. Oh, wow. And we're going to read through the book Love of it. Ephesians. So first 15s and um, messages are all going to be centered around that. But y'all, it's time for worship. So thank you, Andrew, for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having uh, me. I will be back here next week, and uh, y'all have a great time at worship. Bye. Bye. My name is Michelle Gary, and I want to welcome you to worship here at First Methodist Mansfield. If this is your first time in worship with us, we want to extend a warm welcome to you as well. Before worship begins, there are three things that I would love for you to know. First, we want to connect with you. So whether you are worshiping online or here in the sanctuary, I want to invite you to fill out our connection card. You can find that card in several different ways. The easiest way is by going to our online bulletin at fmcm.org bulletin. You can also text the word connect to this number you see on the screen, or you can simply scan the QR code located in the pew back in front of you, and it will take you right to the online bulletin. Second, we want to help you take the next step in your faith journey. If you are interested in becoming a member of First Methodist Mansfield, please stop by our connecting point located outside of this worship space or text the word JOIN to the number on the bottom of the screen. Our connecting point is a great place to stop by and ask any questions that you may have or find ways to get plugged into the life and ministry here at First Methodist Mansfield. Lastly, if you are interested in making a gift today, you can do so by visiting one of our drop boxes located outside this worship space or by going to our online bulletin at fmcm.org slash bulletin. Our mission is to make and mature disciples of Jesus Christ who love God, love others, and serve the world. For more information about First Methodist Mansfield, feel free to visit our website at firstmethodistmansfield.org, follow us on social media, download our FMCM app, or text FMCM to 817 817- 477-6498 to stay up to date with everything happening here. Well, good morning. What a joy it is to be in worship with you this morning if we haven't had the chance to meet. My name is Larissa Peacock, and I have the honor of serving as one of your worship leaders here. What a beautiful morning to to wake up and to come to this holy place. Um, I would love for us to go ahead and stand up, and I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer just to kickstart our morning. So if you would, bow your head with me. Oh, holy and loving God, would you come and meet us here, Father? We are so expectant of what you are going to do this morning. And so we ask that... uh, you would clear our minds, recenter our hearts. May our eyes be fixed on nothing but you, Jesus, this morning. Meet us here. Hear our praises to your great and holy name. We love you so much. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
white as snow no
I well, also want to welcome you uh, here today, those uh, in person, those online. If uh, We have a special uh, presentation for uh, some kiddos who are here in person. Uh, any second graders that are here, we want to invite you to come down uh, to receive your second grade Bible as a gift from your church family. I also want you to know if we have some third or fourth graders who have not received a Bible from us, you are more than welcome to also come and receive a Bible. And oh my gracious, they're coming out of the woodwork. Look at this. This is awesome. All right. So kiddos, once you receive your Bible, if y'all want to come up here on the, on the stage, this top, top step, so everybody can see you, just come and line up up here. Come on up, and I'll step down so y'all have plenty of space. Come on up. Don't worry, we have plenty. Yeah, y'all spread out so everybody can see you guys. All right. Okay, so here's a few things I want to show y'all before uh, we say a prayer for you. Um, yeah, when you take your Bible out of your little cover there, which you don't have to do right now, you're going to find a couple things in here. The first thing you're going to find is a bookmark, Okay. And on this bookmark on one side are five of my favorite Bible verses. And then on the back side, our children's staff have also shared some of their favorite Bible verses. So one of the things I would like for you to do uh, with your mom or dad or someone at home uh, is today or in the next couple days, uh, just spend some time with them looking up these verses in the Bible. And if you want to, you can actually write in your Bible, it's okay, Jesus thinks that's wonderful, okay? You can underline things if you'd like to. Uh, you might even put the name of somebody next to uh, a particular verse that they think is really special to them. The other thing I want you to notice, if you'll just look at everybody's Bible, look around you. Do you see that everybody got the exact same Bible? Yes? So, when you get home, I want you to write your name in your Bible so you know that it is yours uh, and we would love for you to bring that Bible with you to church every time that you come. This is our gift to you. This is um, a treasure to us, God's Word, that we are grateful to be able to share with you today. So I want to say a prayer for you uh, and for this gift that your church is sharing with you today. Let's pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for each and every one of these young boys and girls. We thank you, Lord, for the way in which you are already at work in their life, those who are investing themselves in them. And we thank you, Lord, for the, for the hopes and dreams that you have for each of them. We pray, Lord, that by your spirit, through your power, and through your church, through your word, those hopes and dreams would be realized. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, before you go, I want to show you one more thing I forgot to say before. This is my third grade Bible, okay? So it's 35 years old. It's not in very good shape. But I want you to see, this, this is what Bibles used to look like that third graders got, and look how cool you, yours are, much, <laughs> much more cool. So in 35 years, I want to see them, okay? So bring them back. I want to see them. We hope that this is a blessing to you. Will you please join me in celebrating all of these second graders today. If y'all will follow me, we're going to take a group picture outside. If y'all will follow Miss Michelle, you're going to take a big group picture. I have a question. You have a question. Where did I'll walk I, out with you. I saw myself in the, I saw myself in the camera. You did. How wonderful to be in worship with you today and to carry on this wonderful tradition of second grade Bibles. I still have my Bible from third grade also. It's much older than David's though. <laughs> if I haven't met you yet, my name is Jan Davis. I'm one of the pastors here at First Methodist Mansfield. We welcome those that are here in person. We welcome those that are joining us online today. And now we come to the time in our service where we celebrate God's gifts to us and we have the opportunity to give back to God. And if you're interested in making a gift today, there's a slide that we have on the screen.
that shows you the many ways that you can give. You can scan the QR code located on the back of the pew. You can go to our online bulletin or visit the drop boxes um, outside um, the sanctuary area. Your gifts matter. And let's go to the Lord now. Let's give thanks to God in prayer. Holy and loving God, we know that every good gift comes from you. Thank you for blessing us in so many ways. And please accept our gifts and use them, put them to work to bless others. God, we, we thank you for these second graders. We thank you for the gift of your word. Your word is truth. Thank you that we can give them Bibles, that they can learn the word of God. And Lord, also we thank you for all of these donations of food that are sitting up here, all of these gifts of food um, that will feed hungry children during this summer. We ask that you bless the, the gifts that have been brought here and that this food will be well used. Thank you for the opportunity to gather with one another, with fellow believers, and worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask that you open our hearts and minds to receive the message you have for us today um, through our senior pastor, David Alexander. We thank you for his spiritual leadership and the care with which he watches over this, this very large flock. God, we ask that you please bless our church, First Methodist Mansfield. Bless all of our members and all those that gather here. We ask that you bring healing to those who suffer and peace to those who have anxiety and worry or fear. God, bring comfort to those who are grieving and give your abiding presence, your abiding presence to all who seek you this day. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and it's in his name that we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Where does real Christianity now exist? Where do the Christians live? Who are those whose hearts cry out, My God and my all, I desire nothing but you. You are my glory, my delight, my crown. Those of whom we might describe as being rooted and grounded in love, who are being filled with all the fullness of God. Those whose faith is bearing fruit, who live in the assurance of the hope they have found in him, whose love for all neighbors is present in every thought, every word, each action. It is often thought that becoming a Christian is a relatively easy matter. But if that be so, why does the wider world wonder where they can be found? Could it be that we have settled for having a form of religion that lacks any true power? Is it possible that we have stopped short of the ultimate prize? In our comfort, has the church fallen asleep? And if she be found in slumber, is it possible for the church to hear the calling that has echoed throughout her history? Wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Where does real Christianity now exist? Dare we have the courage to set out on the long journey to find it once again? 
Uh, well, if we've not met, my name is David. I serve as a senior pastor here, and I am grateful to, to make it back in here for the message. Uh, we had one of our second graders who had several deep theological questions on the way out, and uh, I answered those as best as I could and then said, read that and come back. We'll talk some more. So we'll see, uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, it is a joy to present Bibles. It's a joy to share the Word of God. Uh, one of the things I, I, I say each week, and it's for, for you here today, those online, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one as well. Uh, you can, if you're here in person, straight out these doors at our connecting point, we have those available for you. Uh, if you're watching online or if you're here in person, uh, you can just shoot me an email and we will uh, we'll get one of those to you. Uh, tonight, um, we're going to have a worship service for our high school seniors. We have 31 high school seniors. Don't know if all of them will be here. It's a rather busy time in the life of a, of a high school senior, uh, but uh, we're going to be having a service for, their, for them here. We're going to pray over them, and we're going to give them Bibles again, uh, many of them who received uh, a second grade Bible here, including the second grade teacher who was just in here. I don't know if you, you saw her. That was my daughter, Anna. Uh, who is a senior, and so she'll be here receiving her Bible tonight, and she received a second grade Bible uh, from you. And so what, what a gift that is, what an expression of what it means to be a family, uh, a church family that's investing in the, in the next generation. I want to celebrate something with you that happened yesterday around 2 p.m., uh, which is that Pastor Julian graduated from Perkins School of Theology. So Julian finished his Master's of Divinity degree, which is a big, big task. It's about double the length of a normal Master's, and it is behind him, and we all celebrate that. So if you don't know, Julian serves as the lead pastor for our Saturday night service that we just launched uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, so he wasn't able to preach that last night, so I had to preach it. And I had said to him over the course of the last few months that I had learned something uh, as he had stepped into that role as we launched that new service. For about 10 years, I served as an associate here at this, at this church, and for most of that time period, I preached on Saturday night, and the senior pastor at the time, Mike Ramsdale, he would preach on Sunday morning, but he was almost always here on Saturday night, and I thought that was so nice that he would come and support, you know, Saturday night, and he'd just be and worship, and, and, and so I've been doing that the last couple months, and, and in doing that, I realized that all along the way, he had been cheating, because he came and got to hear a sermon on the exact same thing that he was going to preach on the next day. And I don't know how often I may have influenced his writing or what he might change in the message, but I told Julian, it's pretty helpful to hear a sermon on what you're about to preach on the, uh, the night before. And so I, I had to do this all by myself this week, preaching all services, but uh, a great day of celebration for Julian uh, and a great gift uh, to our church as well. So speaking of Bibles, if you have yours, we're going to be in John chapter 15, the Gospel of John chapter 15. If you didn't bring your Bible this week, hope you will next week. Um, one, of, uh, uh, one of our staff members whose son just got a Bible, she asked him, are you going to read it? And he said, well, I don't know, but I'm going to bring it every Sunday and every Wednesday because we bribe our kids to bring their Bibles. They get like a Bible box or something. I don't know what all they can do with that, but we haven't done that yet for adults. We're holding off, okay? <laughs> but we do want you to bring uh, your Bible uh, we have over the course of the last, this is week 11 of this season that we've been in, pursuing real Christianity, doing so with a, a, a humble heart, seeking to find what we may have yet to understand about real Christianity and also being open to the eye that there may, or open to the idea that there may have been many things that we have forgotten along the way. So this, this goal, this, this, this whole pursuit, this journey has been about rediscovering for ourselves what does it really mean to live as the people of God, as disciples of Jesus, and to do that in our life together. So we've talked about many things over the course of 11 weeks, but there's two words that I want to make sure that when we finish this, that you know these words and you understand what they mean. The first word is the word justification. And we've talked about justification, we defined it as being made right with God. We've talked about justification as what God does for us in Jesus Christ. This is the gift that God makes available to us through the gift of his son. This is what God does for us. We don't earn it, 
Uh, We haven't come to a place of uh, becoming deserving of it. It is simply God's gift to you and I. This is what happens in the process of making disciples. God justifies us. And it is what God does for us through his son, Jesus. The second word is the word sanctification. And sanctification is becoming more like Jesus. This is what God does in us through the power of his Holy Spirit. So justification, again, is what God does for us through his son, Jesus. Sanctification is what God does in us through the power of his Holy Spirit. Justification is what happens in the making of the disciples. Sanctification is maturing disciples. We've also added in recent weeks this additional distinction that you can think of justification as the first half of the gospel, sanctification is the second half of the gospel. In other words, when you hold these two together, justification being made right with God and sanctification becoming more like Jesus, you see the fullness of the good news, the promises of Scripture. You see the fullness of God's heart and God's character, and perhaps most importantly, the fullness of God's desire for your life and for my life. Not only that we would be set right, that we in our daily living would become more and more and live more and more like Jesus as God sanctifies us. That work that he does in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to continue focusing on sanctification, this second half of the gospel. And I want to look at two things from what Jesus shares here in John chapter 15. Uh, First, the primary context where this work happens and the essential ingredient in the work of sanctification, the work that God does in us through the power of his Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you up front that this is going to sound, at least at first, fairly elementary. Uh, it, it's going to sound at first to some pretty easy. But I just want to warn you ahead of time that of all the things that we've talked about over the course of, of 10 weeks in pursuing real Christianity, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we either find ourselves building momentum in our life or we often find ourselves stalled. It sounds simple, but this, uh, what, what we're looking at here, the primary context, the essential ingredient, really living into this is one of the most difficult aspects of being sanctified, of becoming more and more like Jesus. So again, I'm gonna read you two sections of John 15 Just for context, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples at the Last Supper. So this is the last meal that he's going to share with them. He's about to be arrested. He's going to be crucified. Uh, This is the very end of his life. John 15, he says this, uh, beginning with verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing." Now, end of January, I preached on this same passage. I'm guessing you've slept since then, so I'll just remind you of a few things. In the older language, um, the, uh, so my third grade Bible, uh, this is the Revised Standard Version, which is basically one step up from King James Version. I mean, it's kind of abusive to give this to a third grader and say, here, you know, read this, see if you can understand it. But in the older language, that, that part that you just heard, remain in me as I remain in you, the word is abide. Abide in me as, as I abide in you. And we talked about back in January that that's not a word we use very often. It's not a word that, that comes up in our common, uh, common conversation. So what does it mean in this context? In this context, what Jesus is talking about is making or finding a home. So Jesus is essentially saying, make your home in me as I make my home in you. It's, it's more than just about staying in one place. 
It's about grounding yourself, making a home, finding a home, crafting a home in Jesus as Jesus makes his home in you, which at first sounds really good. Again, it sounds really easy, really awesome. Can you imagine a better roommate than Jesus? The answer is no, by the way. I don't hear you saying it, but the answer is no. Jesus would be an amazing, amazing roommate. And if that's our picture, we may start with this idea of, oh, this is great. We're gonna have a, it's gonna be a small apartment. We're gonna make our home together. It's just gonna be me and Jesus. I don't have to worry about anybody else. This is what the life of faith is. It's just me and Jesus. I'm a branch, he's the vine, I'm connected. Here's our home. But that's not quite what Jesus is saying here. Because notice that as he talks about this idea of abiding in him, this this imagery of him being a vine and we are a branch, notice that there is only one vine but many branches. Which means that when we make our home in Jesus, when we unite ourselves with him, we are necessarily also uniting ourselves with all of the other branches that are connecting to that same vine. It's not a small apartment that I just share with Jesus. It's something quite different from that. All of the branches are connected to a single vine, which is why the, uh, the Christian faith, the Christian life exists, thrives, grows in the context of Christian community. Expecting uh, your life to change, your maturity in Christ to occur, expecting that to happen without Christian community is like expecting a tree to grow that isn't planted in any soil. And when we think about this, this, this imagery that Jesus uses of a singular vine and us each uh, as branches that connect to that one vine, it speaks to how we understand the Christian life and also how we understand the church. That for Jesus, the church is not a place, it is a people. It's not a building, it's a body. You cannot attend church. You can only be the church. And you may not have ever thought about this before, but you can't even do church. Because in the doing of church, if you look at any expression of that, if you, if you look at these, uh, th- this food that's been, that's been gathered here, the Bibles that have been presented, the, these expressions of church, the, the doing of church, it's grounded in our being in sharing life together. That happens in, in community. So, so the primary context, the primary context where sanctification happens is relationship. The primary context is relationship. It is in our relationship with Jesus. It's in our relationship with God, but it is also in our relationship with one another because we're not sharing just an apartment with Jesus. We are a part of, we make a home with a body of people who are connected to that same vine. And the relationships, this this may shock you, but the relationships that we find within Christian community should be the most powerful, life-changing relationships we can ever experience because of our connection together to the vine that is life. So the primary context is relationship. Let's listen to what uh, Jesus says about the essential ingredient. Let's jump down to verse nine. Jesus says this, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. 
You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. So this one's a bit more obvious. If I were to ask you just the question, hey, what's the essential ingredient? No one would want to answer the question because it would seem too simple. But it's it's simply this, the essential ingredient is love. Jesus says the word eight times in five verses. It's pretty clear. The essential ingredient is love. The primary context is relationship, but the essential ingredient in the work of sanctification, what God does in us through the power of the Holy Spirit, the essential ingredient is is love. But even here we see a connection between the two. When we remember that Jesus wasn't talking to a person, he was talking to a group of people. He was talking to his disciples. And so it would be appropriate in reading everything that I just shared with you, the first five verses in 9 through 17, every time you see you, it really is a plural you. He's, he's speaking to the collective. So if you were born in Texas... It would be appropriate to read every you as y'all. I have loved y'all. Y'all now have to love one another. He is speaking to the collective because, again, there's one vine. There's many branches, and it's not simply the love that we share with Jesus or with one or two people. It's the love that is shared together. Now again, that's fairly elementary. That's fairly basic. Uh, If we stopped right here, my guess is that no one would leave and go, whoa, that blew my mind. I had no idea love had something to do with Jesus. I mean, this this is obvious stuff. But the challenge of this, where we start to look at this this idea of this is where the rubber meets the road, this is where things get really, really hard for us in this process of being sanctified, is when we hold up this very basic teaching to some of the common misconceptions that we have about the Christian life. And so over the course of many weeks, we've talked about cultural Christianity, just kind of the, the, the dominant thinking about what Christianity is all about in our culture, not only outside the church but also within the church and part of that we said was the common assumption being that the universal purpose of life is to be happy and to feel good about yourself that is the culturally christian worldview the dominant worldview of christians in our culture today and those outside of the church as well doesn't matter what church people go to What denomination it might be, what part of the country they live in, that is the dominant understanding of Christianity, that the goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about yourself, that human flourishing is found in the accumulation of good feelings, good experiences, and good possessions, the possessions that we desire in our life. And the church, we've talked about this too, the church uh, bears significant blame in this. Leaders like myself, who rather than seeking to work against this worldview, part of what the church has done for decades is to allow ourselves to be consumed by it. And in doing so, we have increasingly seen and presented the church as a product that will help you achieve the goal of the Christian faith, a product that will help you be happy and feel good about yourself will provide good experiences that you can come to and you can leave and go, oh, I feel so good. I'm ready to go back to my, my week and uh, I, I better be back in seven days because I'm gonna need it again, another boost, another, another pill to help me feel better about my life and to be happy in my life. We as, as, as the church, we've been guilty of simply being consumed by this consumer mindset that, that exists all around us in our culture and running parallel to that is this growing sense of hyper-individualism. Here's what Pete Davis says in his book, Commitment. The dominant culture tells us not to get too sentimental about anything. It's better to stay distant, to not hold true to anything too seriously, and to not be surprised when others don't either. Because in our culture, we have this expectation that even the most significant commitments that we make in our life are temporary. 
We have an expectation that, that relationships are really meant to be transactional. That's what we expect of others and we assume that others expect of us. I scratch your back and you scratch mine. We have this expectation that love is contingent upon agreement because, again, the goal is happiness. And when things get hard, that means something has gone wrong. Usually something wrong in someone else. When things get hard, something has gone wrong. Listen to this. Happiness is our goal. Comfort has become a primary value. And individual freedom has become an idol, a false god. We have this false assumption that freedom means that we should be able to do whatever we want to do to pursue happiness in our life without having to worry about how that might impact or harm the life of another. And just for a moment, I want you to think about how sharply that contrasts with the disciplined community that is described in the Scriptures. The word, I am my brother's keeper, I am my sister's keeper. When one part suffers, we all suffer. When one part rejoices, we all rejoice with it. When you look at the scriptures and, and you, you seek to understand what relationships are really all about, what true and real and authentic relationships involve, we recognize that relationships are always an intrusion in our life. They always require us to constrain our freedom. They always involve some level of discomfort, awkwardness, some level. They, they, they create some level of burden on us if we are to live fully into a true and real and authentic relationship with one another. In other words, if we're going to place ourselves in that primary context, by which God sanctifies us and grows us, it requires us to have relationships that are deeper than just superficial. Relationships that understand that my freedom is meant to be constrained. The burden is meant to be felt. Difficulty actually means things are probably going right as opposed to things are going wrong because we are sharing life with one another. When one part suffers, we all suffer. I am, in fact, my brother's keeper, my sister's keeper. And all of this culminates in how we understand this one word, love. Jesus said, love each other. Love each other. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to love each other? Well, if you look at the cultural definition of love, it's happiness. Love is about making someone else feel happy, and it's about feeling happy while we love others. We, we see it as an end into itself. It, it, it makes us feel happy, and in loving others, we make them feel happy as well because, after all, that's the goal of life. The goal of life is to be happy and to have good feelings about ourselves. And so we, we devolve into this idea that love is contingent about, uh, on agreement or love is about agreement. We believe that if others don't agree with us, they are not loving us. Why? Because you just made my life uncomfortable. Why would you do that? That's not nice. I was doing just fine until you told me something I didn't want to hear. I don't know about you, but some of the most disagreeable people in my life are the ones who have loved me the best in my life. We have this false sense that if others don't agree with us, they are not loving us, or equally damaging, we believe that if we don't agree with others, we cannot love them. But listen to what Jesus says. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. Love, according to Jesus, is suffering. Love, according to Jesus, is sacrifice. Love, according to Jesus, is laying down your life for the sake of another. It isn't about happiness. It isn't about making someone else feel good or making ourselves feel good. It's not about happiness, it's about holiness. 
Love is about holiness. And let me just give you one specific example of that. If you come by my office, there's some books that you'll always find there if, if you ever want to pick one up. Uh, it's a book that I give to couples in, in pre-marriage counseling and uh, those whose wedding I'm going to do, a book called Sacred Marriage by Gary Thomas. And whenever I give them the book, I tell them this is not your normal pre-marriage book. This isn't 10 Steps to Better Communication. You can find those books. There's nothing wrong with them. But this book, Sacred Marriage, is essentially about the beautiful chaos of sharing your life with another human being, okay? It's about the messiness, uh, but also the beauty of that. And so the book, uh, even though it deals specifically with marriage, it really applies to all human relationships, it, it, it applies to any relationship that we have with others. And so I want to read you a section of this, this book. In, the, in here, he is specifically speaking to marriage, but I'm going to read it differently because it's equally applicable to all of us and all of our relationships. Here, here's what he says. Uh, what rela- relationships have done for me is hold up a mirror to my sin. So, out the back today, if you'd like to sign up for relationships, we're going to let you do that, because that sounds like fun, right? You get to sign up, we're going to give you a little mirror, right, as, as you leave. That's, well, here's what, this is what he says, the value of relationships in his life. It's held up a mirror to my sin. It forces me, he says, to face myself honestly and consider my character flaws, my selfishness, and my anti-Christian attitudes, encouraging me to be sanctified and cleansed, and to grow in godliness. Listen to this. Sometimes what is hard to take in relationships is not what we find out about others. It's what we find out about ourselves. That's what we mean when we talk about love is about holiness. That's what we mean when we talk about the primary context uh, in, in which sanctification happens. We are transformed, we mature, it it happens in this this context, and the essential ingredient that must be present in that is love, love that is willing to suffer, love that is willing to sacrifice, love that doesn't say, well, first you have to meet me here in the middle, and then maybe I'll get there too, but love that says, I will come to where you are as a way of surrendering myself over and over and over again to you, this is where the rubber meets the road. And this is where we start to enter into a way of life that most of us, when pushed, would rather just walk away from. And we have the great opportunity in our world to simply move a few steps away from anyone who might cause us discomfort, anyone who might disagree with us, Anyone who may inhibit us in our pursuit of a life that we think will make us happy or feel good. And in doing so, we, we end up pulling ourselves out of the primary context where sanctification happens. And we close ourselves off to the essential ingredient that God uses in that work the primary context when it happens, and the essential ingredient in that work. So let me tell you one more illustration of this. This is one of those things that just comes to your head, and it's always a bad idea, but I'm going to go ahead and jump in this. First year, I uh, uh, led a trip to Israel. Uh, We go every two or three years. We're going again in January if you want to uh, come with us. Um, I was seated at lunch with our guide, Uh, a Palestinian, and he asked me this question, why didn't you bring your family? Now, this is like six years ago. Kids are are really little, and I just thought that was the craziest question he could possibly ask me. Why wouldn't I bring my family? I'm in Israel. This is crazy. I mean, this is is dangerous. And he just kind of laughed. And and, uh, he said, you know, if I I turned on cable news and, and developed my perception on America based on that, would that be an accurate picture? I was like, well, no. Duh. It's like, well, why would you assume that life here is like that from what you would see in that presentation? And here's what he said to me that I've, I've never forgotten. He said, in America, you are spoiled. Well, that wasn't new for me to hear. But the way in which we are spoiled was something I'd never heard verbalized before. He said, you are spoiled by space. 
you are spoiled by space. If you find yourself in conflict with someone, if you find yourself disagreeing with somebody, if you find yourself in any way uncomfortable uh, in your relationship with someone, you can, just, you can just walk away. You can move down the street. You, you can distance yourself so easily. He said, here, we don't have space. We have to figure it out. We have to figure it out. We have to come together one to another, and in, our, uh, in the difficulty of sharing life with one another, we have to figure it out. We have to talk about it. We have to forgive. We have to be honest with one another. We have to confess. We, we have to work it out. And I want to suggest to you that the church should be a place where that is also true, where we refuse to quit on one another, where we completely reject the lie that we've got to agree on everything in order to love one another. But that the church could be a place where sanctification might happen because of the relationships that we share and our commitment to live into a love that is about more than just one another's happiness, but it's about growing in holiness. That's the goal. That's the goal that you would live a holy and blameless and righteous life. You hear that language over and over again throughout the New Testament. That's the goal. That's our prayer. That's why we spent so much time talking about what real Christianity is all about, that you would live a holy life. I forgot this quote from John Wesley. He says this. It's in here somewhere. The gospel of Christ knows of no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Here's what that means. If your desire is to live a holy life, it doesn't happen on your own. It happens in relationships and with the essential ingredient of love. Let's pray together. Loving God, we confess to you how easily we find ourselves wanting to pull back How quickly, Lord, we find ourselves in a moment of awkwardness or discomfort just thinking that it's not worth it. And I pray, Lord, that you would reveal to our hearts the ways in which we have undermined ourselves and actually worked against what you are doing in our life. by surrendering to this temptation to run away. I pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage to lean in and that today for each person here, you would reveal the specific places that you might be calling them to lean in again. The specific relationship that you might call them to to lean back in in a spirit of sacrificial love. Help us each, Lord, to know that, that step that we need to take so that we might experience your deepest desire for each and every one of us, that we would grow in righteousness and holiness, filled to the fullness of the knowledge and love that you have shining like stars on the darkest night, living as the people you've called us to be and you've created us to be. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, I I don't know about any of y'all, but I uh, I have really loved... This, this season of real Christianity. Um, I've never been more challenged, I don't think, in my life. Um, and I don't think I've been more on fire um, in my life. This has been um, life-changing for me. 
and has really just made me rethink a whole lot um, of what it means to be a Christian. And, and I can't really stop uh, writing songs about it. And, uh, and so we're going to sing one uh, for y'all today. It's called Set Free. And I had just realized there's a lot of, a lot of songs out there about freedom. We talk a lot about freedom, but I just never really hear anything that says what it means to be free and what we've discovered it means to be free. It's not free to do whatever we want to do. It's free to pursue Jesus. So, so kind of wrote a song about it. And, and I've got a couple others. I just wanted to ask y'all first because I, I, I just was curious. Would it be okay if next week we just like sang a few more songs that I'd written? I, I didn't realize Real Christianity Season 1. <laughs> it's about to end. Season one's about to end. And I was like, man, I got like three other songs that I got to share with you guys. <laughs> so I just want to invite you. Uh, this, this time, uh, if you want to try and sing along, please do. If you want to just pray or if you want to come up to the altar, um, please do. Really just think about this, uh, this time. Just think about how you've been set free. You have been set free from the sin that has fought with you for so long. You've been set free from its power and penalty on your life. And you've been set free to pursue Jesus faithfully. So this song's called Set Free. We pray that it blesses you.
We leave this time of worship, we go, we are set free. And we leave, we know we are connected. We are connected to the vine. We are connected to Jesus Christ. We are connected to one another, the branches, this body of believers. And we leave this place, we go seeking to be sanctified, seeking to grow in holiness, seeking to be made mature as disciples, knowing that God can do it. And we can ask to be filled with love. Sanctifying grace fills us with perfect love and enables us to live a life of love, loving God and loving others. Go in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Go in that love. Amen. Amen.